All right, this morning's message is going to be from Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And I uh, was thinking, I really had some other, other sermons that I had uh, planned that I wanted to preach, but um, I feel like this is, this is one that we can, we can all use uh, during, during this time. And so uh, Psalm chapter 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. And I'm going uh, gonna to read it. And um, you're welcome to uh, join with me um, if you would like. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, uh, as we, uh, the a few that are here is uh, the deacons and, and uh, just the, the very uh, few that are physically here is we, we want to be available for people and for their spiritual needs, understanding we can't meet under normal circumstances. Um, and Lord, those that uh, will listen to this uh, through an online platform, uh, I just, I pray this will be a help. It will be a comfort. It will be a blessing. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would be magnified uh, through each word uh, that is spoken. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for being a mighty God. We ask you to bless this time. We pray these things in the holy, precious, eternal name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The 23rd Psalm is the most readily uh, identifiable passage, not only in the book of Psalms, but also in the entire Old Testament. The 23rd Psalm is easily grouped together with the most well-known portions of the Bible, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, John 3.16, and Psalm 23. And so it's a very familiar uh, passage to believers and, and really even those that would not uh, recognize that the Bible is in fact God's revelation to man. It's the word of God. Uh, they're familiar with, with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, they at least know the first part of it. I don't know if there's any way uh, that we can know for sure, but it's believed that Psalm 23 is the most quoted portion of the Bible in history. David almost certainly penned this when he was king of Israel. Many years after he was a shepherd, remembering when he was a teenager and cared for his father's sheep. Charles Spurgeon has a most eloquent prologue of this chapter that I must share with you because I'm unable to, uh, to improve on, on his description. And he uh, wanted to describe the influence that these six sentences have had and they continue to have on humanity. Spurgeon said this, it has charmed more griefs to rest than all the philosophy of the world. It has remanded to their dungeons more felon thoughts, more black doubts, more thieving sorrows than there are sands on the seashore. It has comforted the noble host of the poor. It has sung courage to the army of the disappointed. It has poured balm and consolation into the heart of the sick of captives in dungeons, of widows in their pinching griefs, of orphans in their loneliness. Dying soldiers have died easier as it was read to them. Ghastly hospitals have been illuminated. It has visited the prisoner and broken his chains, and like Peter's angel, led him forth in imagination and sung him back to his home again. It has made the dying Christian slave freer than his master and consoled those whom dying he left behind mourning not so much that he was gone as because they were left behind and could not go 
2. Millions of souls have been comforted by this holy passage. Pastors have used it countless times to help those going through severe personal trials, illness, or when their earthly sojourning is expiring. For some, these precious words have been the last their tongue has spoken as they departed this life. Departed this life into the hands of the shepherd they trusted. I believe God would have me speak on this topic today because for the first time in my life, and probably everyone's life that hears this, we're going through something collectively that we have never experienced before. Our world, our nation, our community is experiencing a virus move through, and there's real uncertainty of what the conclusion will be. You know, we don't quite know how, how bad it's, it's going to get uh, in our country. Psalm 23, six sentences, 118 words of comfort, of help, of calming from our Heavenly Father. This text is a text that makes it seem as if God reaches down from heaven and just wraps his heavenly arms around the needy soul. And today we find ourselves very needy, very needy indeed. I want you to see something interesting <clears throat> before I really get into the text itself. Uh, with the chapter before Psalm chapter 23, with Psalm chapter 22 and Psalm chapter uh, 24, Psalm chapter 22 is the Psalm of the cross. Psalm 22, one, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Of course, uh, that phrase is familiar to us because it's what Jesus lamented when he was on the cross. In Matthew uh, chapter 27, verse 46, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And David, 1,000 years before Jesus died on the cross, David described what our Lord would go through in Psalm chapter 22. And so Psalm 22 is the Psalm of the cross. Psalm 24 is a kingdom psalm. It's about Christ's future kingdom. And so I just want you to notice that timeline there. You have the cross in chapter 22, you have the shepherd in chapter 23, and then you have the future kingdom in chapter 24. And it's like, you know, the cross, Jesus went through, you know, death on the cross. He died, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He went through that so that he can then be our shepherd. And, and eventually he would set up his future kingdom. And so to me, it's a really neat timeline how it's ordered in that way. Look at verse one. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, our God is, is such a personal God. He chose to manifest himself to his creation with the opportunity to have a personal relationship with him. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23, the Bible says, am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off. And so, you know, God is a very present God in, in our lives. The Lord is my shepherd. And I really want you to, you know, grab those words. You know, sometimes we, we can know a passage of scripture so well, we, we just skip over what God's trying to tell us. The Lord is my shepherd. He's a, he's, he's a close God. You know, we need to recognize that as is, is, is obvious and, and as plain as that. You know, oftentimes we, we recognize God working in other people's lives. We say, wow, that person's close to God or that person, they, man, they seem like they have a really vibrant relationship with God. And man, they're, they're following Jesus closely. And, and we, we think that other people have something that we, we only wish that we can have. The Lord is my shepherd. And so may we grab a hold of that concept and, and realize that, that he is your shepherd. 
He's a very personal God. He want, he's personally and intricately involved in your life. Do you know that there's never been a person on the face of this earth that God has loved more than you? He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And he demonstrated and proved his ultimate love to you when he died on the cross. God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so God loves you. He wants to be your shepherd. Recognize that. Embrace it. The psalmist goes on to say, I shall not want. You know, David didn't say that he never wanted. What's being expressed here is that his God and your God has always provided for the needs that you have. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. God has always provided my needs. And I know that's true because if you're listening to this, if you're here, if you're listening to this, you listen to it online, then God's provided your needs up until this point. You're, you're alive. You know, I did a little research and one person inhales 11,000 liters of air in a day. 20% of that is pure oxygen, making your oxygen intake 550 liters of air. And so we're probably more familiar in America with the two liters that the soda comes in, right? And, uh, and so... You know, make sure I was thinking of this with everyone with all this extra food and all this extra time. I think <laughs> when we get through this, I think some people are going to have to go on some diets. <laughs> but um, just picture 275 two liters all lined up. That's how much pure oxygen you breathe every single day. That's a lot of oxygen to keep one person alive. And so God provides the oxygen you need every single day. And, you know, I say that because we take, no, very rarely do we think about breathing until we have a difficult time breathing. And then it, be, and then it can become an issue, you know, when, whenever you, you, you know, but generally we just take for, we don't, it's there, it's there. And so, you know, God provides that, that, that thing that we take for granted, he provides a whole lot of it. Water, take for granted, right? I just went and got a nice glass of water a little while ago. We got water. Water is a foundation for sustaining life. And our children, uh, through the years, you know, they ask us questions about everything. And and it, and uh, I remember recently, maybe a little further back, but I remember one of the myriad of questions that they asked. They say, you know, Daddy, where does water come from? And of course, God made water. That's God made it. That's where, where it comes from. You know, the ability that we have, you know, with all the scientific achievements and technological advances, we still can't make water. I know maybe, maybe that seem you know, that might seem as a kind of a surprising thing, but uh, I, I read some stuff about it. To create water, oxygen and hydrogen atoms must be present. Mixing them together doesn't help because you're still left with just separate hydrogen and oxygen atoms. The orbits of each atom's electrons must become linked. And to do that, we must have a sudden burst of energy to get them together. But as I read, there's a big problem with that because hydrogen is extremely flammable and oxygen supports combustion. And so if you try to do it, you get a big boom. And uh, it's, that's not a good thing. And, but water is this amazing thing that makes up most of our Earth's surface. It makes up most of our body. And God just freely he created it and he freely gives it to us. He freely gives us water and air. You know, the next time, and I hope that as we see the grocery stores packed, the store shelves empty at a time. I've never seen it like this before in my life and um, to this degree. Um, I mean, even when we're preparing for storms and stuff, it's never been a sustained amount to this degree that, I, that, that I've ever seen. Um, and just, to, you know, uh, the, the Walmart cashier said that Walmart has done more business in the last seven days than any time in the history of the company in store business. I, it's just it's really incredible. Last Friday, Walmart did more 
business than they did on Black, on Black Friday, which tells you something because that's a day everyone goes shopping. And I just say all that because there's a real, there's a real concern that, that people are, are having. Am I going to have enough food? You know, we, we so easily, when times are plentiful, we take for granted all the food and, and abundance that, that we have. And, you know, it, it reminds me of the story of Joseph. You know, when he, when he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, he says, we're going to have seven years of the most plentiful crop we have ever experienced. But we need to prepare because it's going to be followed by seven years of famine, unlike the world has never seen. And, and so we, I say that because we take food for granted. You know, and even, even where our food comes from, we, we, you know, we don't even think, we just go to the store and we say, oh, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy some steak. I'm going to buy some burger. I'm going to buy some bread. And, you know, sometimes we, we miss, there was uh, someone, someone uh, in our church that um, told Leslie that uh, the butcher at the uh, grocery store said that the supply line, we could have a meat shortage because there's only, you know, there's only so much in the supply line, you know, that we can, we can produce. And, and I say all that because next time you sit down and, and have a meal, you know, think about the, all the miracle that went through and, you know, you, you have a, you have a nice juicy steak and you know, that the miracle of, of a cow gave birth to another cow and, and nursed it. And, and then that was raised and, and, and eventually, you know, that it, it drank water and breathed air and just all the miracle that, that just, we live in this world that's exploding with life that God created. And I, I say all that because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, God has created for us this unbelievable just supply of things. And of course, we've been able to harness and improve those practices through our, the mental capacity he's given us and the ingenuity, but we have a great God and he's provided our needs. And I just want to just encourage you to trust him to continue to provide for those physical needs. And uh, God created this beautiful world exploding with light, abundant, sustaining sustenance for us. And we need to trust that he'll continue to do that. And in verse 2, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You know, so many times in my life, I, I wanted to go a certain direction. Um, I wanted to do certain things. And I've, I, I've witnessed God open doors and close doors. And oftentimes when you're going through it, you don't really understand, God, why did you close this door? Why did you open uh, this door? But this, this psalm really helps explain that. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. You know, God is orchestrating and he's opening and closing doors in your life for the purpose of growing you spiritually. So you would lie down in green pastures. You know, I take great comfort, as you should, as... We walk with God and we attempt to serve him in spirit and truth with our lives that he's leading us. He's leading us. He's growing us. He's making us lie down in green pastures. You know, some have uh, used this part of Psalms to share uh, an illustration that I, I don't share because I don't believe it's historically accurate. But I've, I've heard multiple people share this illustration that a shepherd when he would, uh, would care for a flock of sheep and when one of the sh uh, sheep would continually to wander off, that in order to protect that sheep, that the shepherd would break the leg of the sheep to make him, make that sheep lie down in green pastures as a protective mechanism. And, and I've heard people share that illustration and say, you know, that, that God, God does that with us kind of a thing. Um, but that's not actually what shepherds do. And I actually, years ago, I read an article in Sheep Magazine. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is, there is such a thing. All right. Um, run out and get, I don't know if it's still in print now, but it was several years ago. And it's, you know, it's distributed among shepherds around the world. Well, in Sheep Magazine, they had an article uh, about this. And uh, what shepherds will do if, you, if they have a sheep that continues to wander off and, and for that sheep's protection, they would break the sheep's leg. They would put a mechanism on that sheep to, to slow, to, to, to limit its mobility, to stop it from wandering off. 
And so the Lord is my, uh, or rather he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He doesn't break the leg, he breaks the leg. And, and I often feel like that's how God, you know, he, he closes doors. He causes us to, to come before him, to be molded and made, made into the image of Christ. You know, and I was thinking about that, and I believe it's particularly pertinent now, is many people's lives as a result of, of this virus that's spreading around the world, many people's lives have slowed down. Schools are closed down. Many people uh, are not able to go into work. They're, they're, they've been sent home or they're working from home. And so God has, for, for, for many of us, slowed down our normal operation of business. Now, I understand that some people are, are ramped up there. If you're in the healthcare facility, I mean, you're, you're maybe you're running harder than you've ever run before. And we need to pray uh, for those people particularly. But he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And, and so if God has slowed your life down and uprooted your schedule and your normal operation, uh, use that as an opportunity. Recognize that he, he's, he's, he wants you to be strong and healthy spiritually. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He wants you to be healthy spiritually. And he has a way to accomplish that. He restoreth my soul. God has restored my soul so repeatedly. And, you know, all of us, we go through discouraging times and and uh, depressing times. And, um, I, you know, I've told you that, you know, I've shared that it's like clockwork, like one or two days a month where I can't even explain it. Like my, it's like a cycle. My, my, I, I, my body, I go through depression one or two days a month. And uh, I can't even, I can't, I don't even know why. It's like, I know, and when it hits, I'm like, okay, this is my time. I need to pray a little more. I need to walk with God a little bit more. I need to read my Bible a little bit more. I need to get a good night's rest. And, and, but, you know, he restoreth my soul. Reading the Bible, uh, letting God speak to you through his word, communing with him as you go about your daily, you know, as you go about your daily routine and rhythm, whether it's driving in the car, whether it's taking a walk, whether it's doing a, a, a kind of a, maybe a monotonous job at work or whatever, just commune with God throughout your day. And then also have that time that you would set aside and say, I'm, I'm going to take the next 15 minutes or I'm going to take the next 30 minutes or I'm going to take the next sweet hour of prayer. I'm going to take this next amount of time and I am going to seek the Lord's face in prayer. I'm going to pray. And so allow God to restore your soul. I tell you right now, if, you, if you're watching the news 24-7 and, and you got 16 alerts from every news thing clicking on your phone, um, you're, you're going to think the world's ending tonight. All right? The world's not ending. All right? I mean, God, God's not done yet. All right. Um, now, are, are we closer to the end today than we were yesterday? Yeah, just like we're closer today than we were a thousand years ago. And um, but uh, God's got a lot more work to do. And you know, even just just thinking, this isn't even in my notes. I'm thinking about when the, where Jesus talks about the early and the latter rain. You know, he's listen. He's ushering ushering in his prized possession, those created in his own image, those that were given an eternal living soul, either will live eternally with him or die eternally in a lake of fire. But, but this creation that God made, he's ushering into this final conclusion. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And those that know Christ are going to worship him for eternity. And so why, we're, why, why we have breath in our lungs why we have spirit in our body, let's, uh, let's walk with God. Let's allow him to restore our soul. And so I'm just, I'm telling you, I've purposed with not knowing really what the schedule is going to be for church um, uh, beyond next Sunday. We just really don't know what the government mandates are going to be, what, what's, what exactly is going to happen. I'm just, I'm purposed. I'm, I hate this. I'm actually excited that I'm just going to take this. I'm just going to take this time, and I'm going to grow spiritually. I'm going to take this time and and invest in my family, with my children. Stay connected with people the best we can, but allow God to restore your soul uh, during this time. In Psalm chapter thirty-seven, 
Verse 23, the Bible says the steps of a good man or good woman are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. And so he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And as you submit yourself to the Lordship of Christ, he will lead you for his namesake. As Mike so uh, beautifully prayed that uh, we're, we're here for God. We're not here for ourselves. We're, 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 we're here for his name and his glory and for his sake. And as we are going through a, a change in, in the normal schedule, as maybe some of us are struggling emotionally and with anxiety and fear during this time, just remember this is all for his name's sake. You know, I'm oftentimes struck with the thought that in, in 100 years, it's unlikely that no one is, is no one's going to, no one's going to know anything about me. You know, I might be buried over there um, at the Lyme Baptist Cemetery in 100 years and, and they'll say, oh yeah, well this guy, this guy was the pastor of Lyme Baptist Church 100 years ago. You know, outside of my, I'll be uh, buried, I want to be buried right by Russ over there, right? You know, see where your plot is. But, you know, outside of my, my, grand, my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, it's unlikely that anyone's going to know anything about me. But let me tell you one thing that is certain. In 100 years, Jesus Jesus' name will be known. Amen. And so, you know, I say all that because when, our, when you boil, you know, the irreducible element of Christianity is Jesus is Lord. It's, it's, when you boil it all down with everything, Jesus is Lord. And we are here to give him glory. And that's why we're here. For his name's sake. And it's important to keep that perspective. It's important. It really is because now is a time where I'm seeing a lot of people lose perspective. In Psalm chapter 100, verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. I want to give just a few practical suggestions for us during this time. Number one, allow God to lead you during this time. Don't allow fear or panic to control you. If you're following the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and trusting him, and as 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. If, if you're following the God of the Bible, we don't have to fear. Be smart. You know, we don't, we don't want to be deliberately irresponsible with this, so be smart, exercise wisdom, exercise caution. You know, be smart, realize ultimately that is, is, is Job said that God put a bound, he, he's put a boundary on my life and no one's going to go past it. And, and, uh, you know, I was telling, I was telling Leslie, I said, I mean, listen, we're going to, we're going to be smart, but the bottom line is if, if God wants us out of this earth, if, if he wants either one of us to get sick and, and to depart this life, that's his prerogative. You know, I, I have an expiration date on my physical life on this earth and God knows when it is. And I do not. And, and I tell you, if that's not, you know, we, we talk oftentimes about being spiritually ready, about, you know, you know not when the master cometh home. And, and so, you know, we, we talk a lot about that. And I think when, when we're experiencing something like this, it becomes a little bit more real. You know, all of it becomes a little bit more real because there's a, there is a, a, a possibility that any one of us could get this virus and it could be, be fatal. I understand that. I, I, I still believe that the chances are very low, but it's there's there's families around the world that are experiencing this firsthand. It's very real to them, and so be sure that we're not allowing fear to control us, and we're trusting Him. Be smart, but not fearful. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. Trust God to provide for your needs during this time. 
you know, I, I'm thankful that um, our government's taking action and, and, but you know what? I'm not trusting the government. I'm not trusting our, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm wanting them to do the job that we put them there for and the reason why we have a government, Romans chapter 13, the government's ordained by God, but my trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Because I, I believe that he can provide for my needs. And we were telling our children the story of um, Elijah and the, and the widow, and the widow's son that he went and she had that little amount of food, that little cruise of oil and that, and that, little, that, little, that little meal, that little uh, wheat in that container. And there was a famine in the land and God provided enough for them to eat every single day during that famine. And I just think that God can provide. God can provide all of the needs you have. Uh, maybe you're, you're, you lost your job because of this. Uh, maybe you're, you have an economic difficulty. I just say, bring it to the Lord. Bring it to your Savior and ask him to provide for you during this time. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You know, if God has slowed your life down, recognize that perhaps he's making you lie down in green pastures. And, and listen, I know I'm reading all these things where, you know, people are, you know, uh, subscribing to Netflix and, and all these other things. And, and uh, you know, I understand that there's going to be some entertainment. You're going to occupy yourself, but make sure you balance that. You know, we don't need to spend all our time watching the news and, and watching movies. We can spend this time to, to use it as a time to grow spiritually. Recognize, okay, God, you've slowed me down. I'm kind of, um, you, you know, quarantined. And I think I, I heard that uh, Connecticut might have a stay at home and probably Rhode Island will probably not be far behind. But use it to grow spiritually. Embrace it. Grow closer to him. Uh, we didn't have a kids club this Wednesday. And so we did a kids club at our house with our four kids. And so we, we did songs and uh, we, we had it. We were like, we were getting a little Pentecostal in the Fields house. I got to say, we, we, we got in a circle and we were all dancing around a circle and uh, we were, we were doing some Bible songs we knew. And then the kids, they wanted to do uh, newsboys, God's not dead. And they were all doing like little dances. I think Levi probably won the dance off. His, his moves were really good. But we just had a great old time. Leslie did a, she did a Bible study. And then it was really neat. And that's why I share this because um, our children, they, we, they started to have some questions after the Bible study. And for like about 30 or 40 minutes, and now it was like, it was, this was going like later. You know, it's kind of like, it's at church. Like when I preach too long, it's just like, man, I got plans, you know. But no, it was, they, for like 30 or 40 minutes, they were asking questions about the Bible. And it was just so neat you know, to be able to answer their questions and say, what about this? What about that? And then there was a little competition. One wanted to ask a better question than the other, but it was, it was a really good time. And, um, we just had a, just a great time and it's just, we just bonded together, you know? And, and honestly, I was kind of, the Holy Spirit kind of told me, it's like, well, why don't you do this more? And, and it, you know, some of it is because we're like, we come here and we do it, you know, we, we do it here, but it was a really special time. And so listen, if, 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 uh, you're listening to this and do home church and, you know, mom and dad, give a devotional and, you know, read the Bible. Use this as a time, you know, allow this to be a time where you're, you're lying down in green pastures and you're being led beside those still waters. Grow spiritually. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I just want to close. If you don't, do not know Jesus as Savior, you can know him. And maybe you're thinking more about uh, spiritual things, maybe more than you ever have in your life. Uh, maybe you don't really know exactly what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And I just want to tell you a couple things regarding that. Number one, God loves you. God loves you. And from the time that he created you in your mother's womb and he, he formed you and shaped you, he knows the number of hairs on your head, God loves you and God has a plan for your life. God showed his ultimate love for you by sending his son, Jesus, who is God in flesh, to die on the cross for your sins. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And that's the first thing you have to realize. The next thing 
you have to realize is that there's a penalty for sin and we're all sinners. In Romans 3.23, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Each person that has ever walked the face of this earth is a sinner. We have a sin nature. We inherited it. We were, we were born with a sin nature. The only person ever to walk on this earth that never sinned one time was Jesus Christ. He was God. And that's what qualified him to offer himself as a sacrifice for the rest of our sins. And he conquered death and conquered sin and, 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 and took away the penalty of sin for all those that would trust in him through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so you have to agree with God that you're a sinner. You have to admit that you are a sinner and that you need a savior. And you have to invite Jesus into your life to be your savior. It's something that being a, a member of a particular church or, or a particular religion will not allow you to go to heaven. You have to enter into a personal relationship and a personal decision to receive Jesus Christ as savior. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God ha hath raised him again, that Jesus died and buried and rose again from the grave, that we would be saved. And so you have to admit that and you have to invite Jesus into your life. You know, if you are listening to this video and um, maybe you came across it by accident or um, somebody shared it with you, and you'd like to know more about how to receive Jesus as Savior, on our church website, um, linebaptist.com, uh, there's, a, there's a, a page that's titled Jesus. And on that page, it goes through very specifically how you can know Jesus as Savior. And if you have any additional questions, if you just send a contact, our church will get that, and we'd love to reach out and explain and answer any questions uh, that you have. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Lord, I thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, those um, that are here, as we want to be uh, spiritually available to those in our community, thank you for that. And Lord, anyone that would come across this on an online uh, venue, I, I pray that you would, um, you would use it to be a help and an encouragement. And we would realize, God, that you're in control and that you are the good shepherd that gave your life for us so that we can have eternal life. We thank you and praise you for being a mighty God, a mighty Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.